Vita is going to come and read our passage for us. If you're able and willing to do so, would you stand, please, as Vita comes to read to us from James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 23. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well, even that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abram our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out of their way? Another way, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. May God bless the reading of his holy word. As I mentioned a little while ago, Pastor Henry and Emma got married yesterday. And uh, it was a great privilege to be able to go to the wedding. I know some of you also were there. And there were a lot of things that were said and done. All the things that you would anticipate would be in a wedding. A number of things were talked about. You know, all the traditional things of exchanging vows, you know, doing the rings. They had a very special time of taking communion together. But there was, there was one thing that was talked about a lot uh, in that brief ceremony. And that was love. Love. Y'all know what love is? Yeah, okay. Talked about love. Love. You know, as we go through life, most people are looking for love. And I know there's a lot of things that have been said and sung about love, like looking for love in all the wrong places and all that kind of stuff. And you know, we, I, I think it's just the way God created us. We all long to be loved. And I think there's something in most of us anyway that longs to love because it's in a reciprocal thing. It goes back and forth. But it's interesting that in all the stuff that's said about love, all the things that are true about love, all this desire um, and seeking for love, there's often a word added to love when we talk about what we want. And that word is true, right? We talk about love, but we want True love. Well, what's the difference between love and true love? Well, obviously, there's some kind of difference. There must be something that's called love, whether it's really love or not, but yet maybe doesn't quite reach the standard of what we really want or really need. So we, 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 want, we, we talk about wanting true love. Well, believe it or not, I'm not going to talk about love today, but I use that as an illustration to say that just as there is a difference between what we might perceive to be or call or experience as love and true love, whatever that might be, and I hope each and every one of you experience that true love thing, we see that same difference in the area of another principle that's very, very important in the Bible, and that is faith. Faith. There is faith, and then there's True faith or real faith. There is faith 
and there's fake faith or counterfeit faith. You know, this series that we're in now on the book of James, the subtitle is How Faith Affects Life. And there's a number of topics we've tell, talked about along the way. And if you've missed any of those, you can go online on our website and you can listen to them or you can watch them, whichever one you want to do. And we've talked about all these different topics that James is dealing with. James is very practical. That's why I love this, this letter. Um, we're working our way through a lot of practical stuff. And it's like, well, if we claim to have faith, if, if, if faith is a part of our life, if, you know, if faith is there, how does that change us? What does that mean as far as how we go through life? And that's what we've been working our way through. But I wanted to pause today because James does that and say, what really is faith? How can we be sure that our faith is real? Because as I said, James, you know, the passage Vita just read a little while ago, talks about people who claim to have faith, but this is true or that's not true or, or whatever, and this faith or that kind of faith is dead. I don't know about you, but I don't want anything that's dead. You know, we want true love, not dead love. I never hear anybody talk about dead love, you know, but a true faith, not dead faith. James talks about faith that's worthless, I don't want to have a worthless face, faith. So how do we know? How do we know? I mean, have you ever known someone who claimed to be a Christian and they said, I'm a Christian, and you, you, you've looked at their life and, and probably didn't say anything. Maybe you did. I don't know. It depends on your relationship. But it's like, you, you claim to be a Christian, but I just, I just, I just don't see that. You say, well, isn't that judging? Yeah, it is. And in many ways and times, that's not appropriate. But there are, sometimes it is kind of appropriate. You know, Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. And, and, and again, that's another topic for another time about judging. But when we talk about claiming to be a Christian or claiming to have faith, but if someone else were to look at that situation and say, well, I just don't see it, I don't want you to think so much of other people as I want you to think of yourself. If you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to have faith, and someone else knows that, and, and I'd be very quick to say that if that is true, somebody else should know that, what would they think about that? Would they look at your life and say, oh yeah, I can see that. No, that's, that's pretty obvious. Or would they possibly say, really? You, 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 you claim to be a Christian? You, have, you claim to have faith? I don't really see that. And that's really what James is talking about in this passage. Now you might say, well, how important is it really? Anyway, how important is this faith thing? Well, I would tell you that in the Bible, faith is significantly important. Let me just take a minute to talk about the importance of faith. The concept of faith is talked about over 500 times in the New Testament. The Bible tells us very clearly that if you truly are a Christian, you are saved by faith. It's the only way it can happen. It's the only way you can have a relationship with God is through faith. That's found in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We'll read that a little bit later. The Bible also says that it, faith is necessary to please God. In other words, you can't please God without faith. Talks about that in Hebrews eleven six. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says the Christian is to live by faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at that. It covers everything. You can't have a relationship with God without faith. Once you have that relationship, you continue to live the life and you have to do it with faith or by faith. And as you do that, you can't even please God unless you have faith. I'd say faith is pretty important. The title of my message today is Faith That Works. I know about you, but I want something that's going to work, all right? Faith that works. But actually, it's kind of a play on, word, uh, play on words. That's not really the way I mean that when it says faith that works. But the meaning of that statement will become clear as we go through the passage and the text today. Our text today is James chapter 2, verses 11 to 26. And uh, Vita read that just a couple of moments ago. And before we jump into the text, I got to deal with one other issue. If you have a knowledge of the New Testament and basic theology, and you may or may not, we're all in different places in our growth and in our learning and that kind of stuff. But if you are, as Vita read that passage, there may be a couple of things that stood out and it's like, wait a minute. That almost sounds like a contradiction with some stuff that Paul says. You know, sometimes people say, there's a lot of contradictions in the Bible. And I always ask them, well, show me some. 
Because I know there's a number of things that look like contradictions, but they're logical, reasonable explanations for why it seems to be that way. And this is one of those. If we look at this passage that was just read a few moments ago, and we look at verse 17, and James says, faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. And you jump down to verse 20, and it says, faith apart from works is useless. And you jump down to verse 24, and it says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And then you jump to the very end in verse 26, and it says, just as a body apart from the spirit is dead, so also, also faith apart from works is dead. You get this idea that for James, faith and works are tied intimately and intricately together. You can't have one without the other, and you can't be right with God unless you've got both. But then you read the Apostle Paul, and I'm not going to read a bunch of verses, but Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, where Paul says, a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And he says something almost exactly word for word in Romans chapter 3, verse 28. And there have been many people through the years who say, how can this be? How can Paul and James contradict each other? How can they both say separate things? And, and I would just propose to you that they are not contradicting each other. They are not opposing each other. So if that's so, how do we reconcile the apparent contradiction here? Well, you have to understand that they are speaking about different circumstances and different problems within the church. When Paul is preaching, you are only saved by faith, not by works. He is dealing with a specific false teaching that rose in the early church, especially coming from the Jewish Christian side that says, if you want to be right with God... You need to have faith in Jesus Christ, but you need to do this and this and this and this and this. And for them, a lot of it was keeping the Jewish law. The Gentiles, you've got to start doing this. That the Jew, you've got to do all these things the Jews do. And, and Gentile guys, you've got to be circumcised. That was a real deterrent for a lot of Gentiles to become Christians. But there was this whole thing of, you know, it's not just faith. You've got to do a bunch of stuff. And, you know, sometimes we see that even in our world and in the Christian realm today, we call it legalism, where if you want to be saved and have a relationship with God, you've got to keep this big long list of rules, do and don't and this. And if you don't, you're not right with God, you're going to hell. That was the issue that Paul was dealing with. He says, listen, we as Jewish people couldn't keep all the Jewish laws and regulations. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins. And it's by trusting in what he did that we're saved and made right with God. It's not because we keep all of these rules. But James is dealing with a totally different problem. You see, James is writing to people who said that if you just claim to be a Christian and you claim to believe, it doesn't matter how you live. Just say you're a Christian. Say, I believe in Jesus and do whatever you want to do. You see, that's just the opposite of legalism. That's lawlessness. And James was saying, no, 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 no. You know, faith is how we come, become right with God because we believe in Him, because we put our trust in Him. But if we do that, it will change our life. Works, deeds, doing what is good, doing what is right, doing what God calls us to do in His Word is an important part of that walking with Jesus, of growing in our relationship with Him. Paul and James, if they were to sit down and talk about this, they would agree with each other 100%. In fact, one of the best places that, that really illustrates this and summarizes is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. And remember, this is Paul, okay? This is Paul. He's the one that says, you are not justified by works. You are justified by faith alone. But when we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's a gift from God, not a result of works, not all these rule keepings, all that kind of stuff, so that no one may, may boast. And a lot of times we stop there. And sometimes it's appropriate, too, to talk about there because he's really emphasizing it's not about all the good you do or can do or should do to get right with God. It's about trusting in Jesus Christ. It's God's grace. God's grace is how he blesses us and treats us better than we deserve. 
But it's not just like God just pours it out there. It's through Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? And what he did. But we don't want to stop there. Let's go on to verse 10. Right after he says, not a result of works so that no man might boast. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you see, what he's saying is, you're saved by grace. It's not by anything you do, but once you've been saved by grace, you need to live out that life of good works. You need to live out that life of obedience to God. You need to live out that life of what God wants you to do. That's the natural result. So just real quickly, what he's saying here is grace is the basis of salvation. Faith is the gift of uh, faith is how that gift is received, but good works is the natural result if you've really done that. So is that kind of clear? Now you can get more deep into that discussion, but we don't want to spend the rest of our time on that. I, I, I put it this way. We cannot earn our salvation by doing good works. But if we are truly saved, our life will demonstrate good works. And that really is what James is talking about here. So how do I know if my faith is real? That's what James is dealing with here. So let me just give you a couple things. First of all, real faith is more than just talk. Real faith is more than just talk. I talk about people that say, well, I'm a Christian. I have faith. And you look at their life, it's like, I don't see any evidence of that. And again, I, I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm encouraging you instead to look at your own life. Real faith is more than just talk. Look again at verse 14, the, 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 the verse that this passage starts with. It says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but, did not, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Now, in the Greek, that second question, can that faith save him? Um, it's worded in such a way that the obvious expected answer is no. It'd be like somebody saying, that faith can't save them, can it? And that's what he's trying to communicate here. He says, somebody says he has faith. Now, it doesn't say that he actually does have faith or does have real faith. It just says he claims to have faith. He talks about it. It could be somebody who knows all the right things to say. But there's not anything, sub there's no real substance behind it. You know, I, I was going over my notes one last time um, about a, an hour before the service this morning. And I th had this thought. I remembered a visit that, I, that we made to New York uh, one time years and years ago. I know many of you are familiar with New York. And um, uh, I remember going various places downtown New York, and you could buy all kinds of stuff on the street. Did you know that? Yeah, I, I was offered a Rolex, Rolex watch for a really good deal, but I decided not to buy it. You are laughing. You know what that's like. You know, Rolex, Rolex watches, Gucci purses, and all this other stuff. You know, it's got the right name on it, but it's not the real deal, is it? And James is saying there are some people that are like that. They may claim to have the right name. They may claim that they are believers. They may claim they're Christians. They may claim to have faith. He says, but they're not the real deal. But you know, he wasn't the only one who said things like that. You know, Jesus said some things like that. Toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, that almost sounds like a contradiction of Paul too, doesn't it? So it's not just people who claim to be Christians, who claim on their Lord, but it's the ones who actually live it out. Now, Jesus also wouldn't contradict Paul. Jesus also wouldn't say, well, it's not just faith. You've got to live right. What Jesus is trying to say is that if you have faith, you will live right. It's not just about saying the right things. It's not just making the right claims. Then James gives us an example in verses 15 to 17. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. In other words, real faith is more than just wishing someone well. Now, and he's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ, about you know, another, another Christian, but it could be true for people that aren't Christians. If you're aware of somebody that has a need, 
and you're in a situation where you can meet that need and all you do is say, oh, I hope it all gets worked out. God loves you. I'll pray for you. Now that sounds almost sacrilegious. Does that mean we're not supposed to pray for people? No, we are supposed to pray for people. And sometimes praying for people may be the only thing we can do because that's all we have at our disposal. And I'm not making light of praying for people, but I think sometimes we can use that statement, I'll be praying for you as an excuse not to do something else. We should always be praying. That should just be a given. We know about a need. We're going to pray about it. But James says that if our faith is just about what we say, but it never carries through with anything we do, it's dead. Faith without works is dead. If you are able to make a difference and you don't, you say, I wish you well. This is worthless. What good does it do? You see, real faith means we get involved. It means we do something about the problem if we can. I'm not trying to say that you need to solve everybody's problems. You can't. I can't. We as a church can't. We get all kinds of phone calls. God just got one this morning about needs and this, that, and the other, and we do what we can. You know, we have, we have the food pantry where we help people with food. You know, we have a benevolence fund, and, you know, we're not rich, 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 according to some definitions, but we help people as we can, and sometimes we help people with gas. They get stuck on the road. They need gas, you know, whatever, um, and we pray about situations, but we can't help everybody with everything. And the same thing's true for you personally. But the question is, are we willing, are we open, are we desirous to live out our faith by meeting other people's needs when we can? Or is it like, I don't want to be bothered, I'll pray for you, God bless you, I hope it all works out. James says, that kind of faith, it really isn't worth much, is it? You know that old saying, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. You know, anybody can say anything. So often we're find it a lot easier to talk about things than to do them, right? That applies to a lot of different areas in life, exercise, diet, you know, all kinds of things. I mentioned the wedding yesterday and the talk of love. You know, anybody can say, I love you, but do we demonstrate it in the way we react and act and live out that relationship? I have full confidence that Pastor Henry and Emma will demonstrate their love to each other throughout the rest of their lives. I, I just know them well enough, and, and it was such a privilege to be, to, to, to be at their wedding yesterday. And I hope that that's what you experienced with the significant relationships in your life. But you probably haven't experienced that with every relationship in your life. You very possibly have had someone who had expressed to you somewhere along the line their love for you, but you realize it wasn't the real thing. They could say that, but they didn't really carry through. Now, before it makes any of us, and if we'd all be honest, it'd probably be all of us feel too guilty. We all fail at times, don't we? I love my wife dearly, but there are times I fail at really expressing it the best way I can. It's probably true for all of us. But what James says is if we want to make all these statements and claims, but we don't ever really follow through, it's worthless. John said something similar in 1 John 3, 17 to 18. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Again, I ask you, rather than think of people that we know who claim to be Christians and seem to know the right things to say, but their life is a mess, can we just look at our own lives and say, God, do I live out what I talk about? Is what I claim really true on the inside of me? Now, now you may not be perfect yet. And I want to say that, again, no condemnation for those of us who are trying to live for Jesus. And we're all at different places in our walk with God. Some people may have just recently given their lives to Christ and, and you've got a big mess perhaps to clean up. And the good news is God's going to help you do that as you trust in him. It's not going to be easy, but he's going to help you. Maybe some of us are a little bit further along. Maybe some of us are way far along. We, we can't compare ourselves to other people. But the question is, where are we compared to where we need to be in our relationship with God? Are we working on those things that God has laid on our hearts, those things he's made clear to us, or are we all talk? Are we all talk? So real faith is more than talk. Real faith works. See, that's where the title comes in, faith that works. Real faith is more than talk. Real faith works. 
Second thing James talks about here is real faith is more than just believing the truth. Now that sounds almost sacrilegious. Please note I didn't say real faith doesn't involve believing the truth. Real faith does involve believing the truth. In fact, it's hard to have faith unless you know the truth and you believe the truth. You've got to believe the truth and you need to understand the truth to the best of your ability. Although I'll be quick to say you don't have to understand all the truth to believe. Otherwise, none of us would ever get to that point of totally believing because there's still so many things we don't totally understand. But real faith is more than just believing the truth. We look at the passage again, verse 18. He says, but someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You see, for some people, faith isn't so much about what you do, it's about what you believe. It's about, you know, uh, it's kind of an intellectual thing. It's about your knowledge. It's about what you know. It's about It's something to be studied and debated and talked about and discussed. You know, James is, James I don't think is talking to a specific person here. I think he's just kind of throwing an example out there. And he's imagining some, somebody, some intellectual person says, well, you know what? You're into works. You're into doing stuff for God. That's good for you. I'm into really studying the Bible. I'm into really knowing the truth. I'm really into, you know, debating and, and figuring things out. But everybody comes to God in different ways. You've got your thing. I've got mine. I'm going to study God's word. I'm going to understand it and all that kind of stuff. And you go out there and do a lot of great things for God. We're all good. And basically what James says, show me. He says, you know, if I'm out there as a result of my faith, because he doesn't claim to not have faith. He's not saying you should just do good works, forget about faith. He says, as a result of your faith in God and your trust in Jesus Christ, you're doing what God wants you to do. He says, it's obvious. You can see it. But what you claim to have, this faith, this intellectual knowledge, this understanding of truth and theology and whatever it might be, show me. Show me. You know, how how do you see faith? How do you see faith? A teaching we see all through Scripture is that if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, if you claim to be a Christian, it should be obvious somehow in your life and the way you live it. Look at it this way. Could you imagine going to visit some friends, never been to their house before, and they have kids. You're going to have a nice dinner to help that be a little bit uh, more close, friendly, get to know you type time. They have sent their kids to a babysitter's house, okay? And so you arrive at the house. Can I tell you, it will not take long before you will see evidence that kids live in that house. And I'm not talking about a mess, although that may be part of it. When you drive up in the driveway and you see the swing set poking around the corner of the house in the backyard, you go in the house and you see the pictures on the wall and it's not just that couple you've come to get to know better, but it's got some of these little little people in it, you know? You, You see the toys that are stacked very neatly in the toy box or scattered all over the floor, whichever way they happen to do things in their house or whichever way it happens to be at the moment. There's very obvious signs. Children live in that home. And James is basically saying the same thing. He says that if you truly have faith, there will be obvious signs. I like the way this person says, faith is like calories. You can't see them, but you sure can see the results. And and again, James is really good to give an example. Verse 19 He says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You see, there are people who have very strong beliefs about God. And they may have a lot of knowledge. And they may understand biblical truth. They can have great passages memorized. But it's not enough. They can recite Bible verses, talk about doctrine. And James says, big deal. Now, I'm not minimizing that that's a great thing he says just saying i believe in god is not good enough it's not enough to get you in heaven he says even the devil believes that think about this now he mentions demons but the devil can can i tell you something the devil knows more about the bible than you do the devil knows more about the bible and theology than i do and i've been studying it for 50 years the devil and his demons know more about truth than any believer alive today Are they saved and on their way to heaven? 
No, that's why they shudder. They understand truth more than any human being would be, and they know where their destination is. He says, if you claim to be a Christian and you believe you're all right with God just because you know a bunch of stuff and you claim and, you, and, you, and you've got it all figured out and you're a theologian to whatever degree, he says, congratulations, you got the same faith as a demon has. Anybody ever told you you had demon faith? <laughs> no, hopefully they haven't and hopefully it's not true. But that's basically what he's saying. You know, spiritual beings, good, bad, they understand. They know theology backwards and forward. Doesn't mean they have a relationship with God. Now, real faith definitely means believing or includes believing the truth, but it's much more than that. Real faith is more than just talk and it's more than just belief, okay? But real faith is shown by what you do. Real faith works. See, that's where we, the title comes in. Real, and, and James has been saying it all along. It's not like a, woo, the light just came on. Real faith is shown by what you do. Real faith works. You know, real faith does include talk. We shouldn't be ashamed that we're Christians, okay? We shouldn't be ashamed to say, I'm a person of faith. You know, I don't do it perfectly, not yet anyway, but I'm a follower of Jesus, and real faith does involve belief. We need to know the truth. The truth is what sets us free. The truth is what sets us on the right course. The truth is what keeps us from getting involved in a cult or something else that's going to get off the path that God has for us. So that's significantly important, but it must go beyond that. If it truly is real faith, it'll make a difference in the way we live. You'll know it's real by the fact that all these things result and actions. And you know, James has already talked about this. You may remember a couple of messages back when we looked at James chapter 1 verses 22 to 27 where James says, be doers of the word, not just hearers only. This is kind of a follow-up for that. He says, listen, don't just listen to what God says. And he goes a step further. You may have it all memorized and everything, but do it. Live it out. And so he comes back to that in this passage. And so now he gives two illustrations that show real faith, faith that works. And I'm not going to reread these particular ones. I encourage you to, to um, go back and read them again. Other than the fact in verse 20, he says, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? The word for foolish there literally is empty. It says, if you have a quote, have a faith that doesn't make a difference in your life, it's emptiness. It's foolishness. He says, you want to see some proof from our own scriptures? Because he's talking to primarily Jewish Christians. And he gives two examples. And it's really interesting. These two examples are two different people from the Old Testament that couldn't be more far apart, more different than if he tried to make them so. Abraham and Rahab. They're opposite extremes. Abraham is a man. Rahab's a woman. That's not meant to be either good or bad. I'm just saying one's a man, one's a woman. Abraham is Jewish. Rahab is a Gentile, one of the heathens, one of the pagans. Abraham is called a friend of God in a couple of places and, and even in this passage. Rahab's a prostitute. Abraham's a major character in the Bible and Rahab is a minor character. Why did he use these two people as illustrations of this principle? It's so far, I think he did it deliberately. I really do. I think he uses these illustrations to say it doesn't matter who you are. You can be a friend of God. You can be the worst of sinners. But if you come to God in repentance and in faith, God accepts you into his family. It doesn't matter how good you are. You still need Jesus. It doesn't matter how bad you are. Jesus is there for you. And I think that's what James is trying to get across here. But in, he's using these as illustrations to show that once you've made that step, once you've chosen, yes, I'm putting my faith in God, that it will lead to actions. You look at the life of Abraham, and we studied it a couple of years ago uh, on Wednesday nights when we made our way through Genesis, okay? And early on in Abraham's life, God reaches out to him. He was a heathen pagan at the beginning. We don't think about that much because he lived such a long life of faith-filled following God. But God reached out to him. And Abraham said, I mean, Abraham put his faith in God. And how was that faith manifested? He did what God said to do. 
So I was studying for it this week. I came across a chart in one of my study Bibles, and it mentions 12 different times in Abraham's life where God asked him to do something in faith, and Abraham did it. Now, the Bible makes it clear it was Abraham's faith that made him right with God. It says Abraham believed God, and it was counted as righteousness. But how did Abraham know that he really believed God? How did God really know that Abraham believed him? It's because Abraham did what he was asked to do. See, that's the point that James is making here. Abraham's faith made him right with God, but we know that his Abraham, Abraham's faith was real because it led to a life of obedience to God. And as I said, this chart in my Bible showed like 12 different times, but... In this particular, uh, in one of the biggest uh, episodes here, we find that Abraham's faith was tried when God asked him to give back the son that God had given to him. The son that was supposed to be the fulfillment of the promise. And Abraham says, yes, God, you can have him. You can have him. I know that, that story raises a lot of questions, and we aren't going to deal with them today. But Abraham's faith was complete. It was real because he was willing to do what God called him to do. The story of Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho, a heathen. The whole city had heard about God releasing his people from Egypt, and now they've invaded the country. They're going to take over. Everybody's in fear and trembling. They're ready to defend themselves except for Rahab. She decides she's going to put her faith in this God that she has never had any contact with before. And James' point is that because she put her faith in that God, it led to her doing things. She hid the spies and she helped them. In the same way, she had faith, but that faith was demonstrated to be real faith because she did something about it. And that was the whole point. So we get to the end of the passage and verse 26 wraps it all up. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. We've all been to funerals. That body's laying there. There is no life. And James says, if you claim to have faith, but it doesn't make a difference in your life, it's just like that dead body. Doesn't matter what you say. Doesn't matter what you believe. If it doesn't make a difference, that faith is not real. It's counterfeit. So is faith just about doing a bunch of good things? No, no. I was looking for a really good definition of faith, and I came across one in the New Compact Bible Dictionary. I like this. I didn't put it on the screen because it's way too long, and you get so busy trying to write it down, you wouldn't hear it. Faith is trust in the person of Jesus, the truth of his teaching, and the redemptive work he accomplished at Calvary. It includes a radical and total commitment to him as the Lord of one's life. I try to kind of put that in a little bit briefer fashion. If you want to write this down, you can. Faith is belief, but it is also trust. Trusting God enough to do what he says. In other words, faith is belief, but it's more than, it's, it's, it's trust. It's trust. Trusting God enough to do what he says. That made me think of a story I heard years ago about a guy who was a tightrope walker and he'd stretched a tightrope across uh, the Niagara Falls. Great crowds had gathered on both sides to watch him go back and forth, back and forth. And he got a wheelbarrow, and he took this wheelbarrow, he wheeled it across. He loaded it down with bricks, wheeled it back and forth. And then he got to one side, and he was talking to some people there. And he talked to this one guy, he says, do you believe that if you sat in that wheelbarrow, I could wheel you all the way across the other side? The guy says, yeah, I believe you could do that. He says, climb in. And the guy says, I don't think so. Now, if you're kind of in that same boat, I don't blame you. I wouldn't do it either. But that does illustrate the difference between belief and trust. We can say, you know, we believe in God, and I, but, but, but we don't ever really trust Him enough to do what He says. And that's what faith is all about. James is saying, you say you're a Christian, prove it. Let me see your actions that back up your words. You can talk the talk. Can you walk the walk? I mean, what would you think if we got into a conversation, I would tell you that, you know what, health is very, very important. And my health is very, very important to me. I mean, I believe it with all my heart. It's a high priority in my life. I've studied a lot about it. I know all kinds of stuff about the right foods to eat and all that kind of stuff, how the body works, and health is important. And so you start asking me questions, say, well, do you eat right? 
And I start talking about all the food I love to eat, you know, all the greasy stuff and the donuts and the cake and, and all that kind of stuff. He's like, well, do you exercise? Well, no, I don't have time to exercise. I'm busy studying about health. You know? Do you get proper rest? Well, again, I, I, I only got so much time in the day. Do you ever take vitamins? Do you, you, know, and always, you know, it doesn't matter what I say. Is health really important to me? It doesn't matter what I know. Is health really important to me? Not if all that's true, which none of that stuff is true, just so you know. Any of you remember a guy by the name of Rich Mullins? Have you ever heard that name? It's a Christian singer who died a number of years ago, but he wrote a song that actually was inspired by this passage. And his, his song was this, Faith without works is like a song you can't sing. It's about as useless as a screen door on a submarine. But you know what? Whether you knew about that song or not, you know about this song. You know that little children's song says, if you're saved and you know it, clap your hands, right? And you stomp your feet. And how does the end of that chorus goes? If you're saved and you know it, then your life will surely show it. And that's what James is saying here. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Now, I am not preaching this message. Well, I'm preaching this message because this is where we are in James, and it's a message God has for us today. My intent in this message is not to get you to question your salvation unless it needs to be questioned. Because you see, if you're living a life and think you're fine with God and you're really not, that is a bad place to be in because you'll never do anything about it. So I just want to challenge you to consider a couple of questions. Am I really a Christian after all? Is my faith real? What changes can I point to in my life? Is my life any different from what it used to be? Is my life any different from somebody who doesn't have faith? Warren Wiersbe was a great Bible teacher, and he says, no man can come to Christ by faith and remain the same any more than he can come into contact with a 220-volt wire and remain the same. Paul, Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. How has faith affected how I live? At home? At work? At school, with my spouse, with my kids, with my parents, with my co-workers, with people I don't even know. Again, the purpose is not to make you feel guilty because you're not perfect yet. None of us are perfect yet. But in your faith that you claim to have, are you truly trusting God? And are you seeking to live out what he's called you to do? Or for you, is it just something you say? or something you believe, but there's no difference in your life. Because if it's that, it's not true saving faith. I'm not saying that. God is saying that in his word. And I challenge you to truly put your trust in Christ. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to pray in just a moment, and then our worship team is going to sing a song, and I encourage you to respond in any way that's appropriate to you. If you, everything's cool between you and God and you just want to worship and sing along, great. But if God has spoken to your heart in a particular way in this message, I encourage you to take the next couple of moments to be a time of commitment and maybe even examination first, some more examination, but, but commitment and surrender. But before we go into that time of song, I, I first want to say that if you are here today or if you're watching this video on the live stream or recording later and you realize perhaps, perhaps for the first time, that you truly do not have your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you thought you did, but you realize it was just something you talk about. It was just something you say. It was just something you say you believe, but you've not let it make a difference in your life. Or maybe this is the first time you've ever really heard the truth of your need for that. I want to challenge you and I want to give you the opportunity to surrender your life to Christ and to put your faith in Him. So I want to ask before I pray, 
Is there anyone that is here that would say, you know what, I need a Savior. I am a sinner. Whether you thought you were fine or not, but today you know I need my sins forgiven. I need to put my faith in Jesus Christ and trust in what He did upon the cross to die for my sins instead of trust in me trying to live my life the best way I can. And today you want to surrender your life to Christ. Would you just slip your hand up because I want to pray for you about that. Anybody at all? You say, you know, I know I'm not right with God. And I want to be today. Today. Okay, well, I'm going to pray a prayer. And if that's you, and especially those of you that are watching this live stream, this recording, if you need Jesus as your Savior, I want to encourage you to pray something very similar to what I'm getting ready to lead us in. It has to be something that you mean, something you say from your heart for it to make a difference. Would you pray something like this? God, I come to you today and I recognize that I am a sinner and my sins separate me from you. Your word says that the wages of my sin is death, but that you offer me a gift and that's salvation through Jesus Christ. I thank you that Jesus came and died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. And I ask that you forgive me. I'm sorry for my sins. I don't want to live that kind of life anymore. I repent. I want to live a life pleasing to you. And I can't do it. I can't do it by myself. But I'm going to choose to trust you. I'm going to put my faith in you. And in my faith in the fact that Jesus died for me. And I want to surrender my life to you. And I ask that you would help me to live for you. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. Come and dwell within me. And help me to live for you. And I thank you that Jesus did that, that he died, he was buried, and he rose again to new life, and that because of that, I can have new life today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll come back in a few moments to close the service, but let's take some time to think, to pray, to respond to what God has spoken to us today as the worship team leads us in a song. Let's just invite the Lord to help us to have a great week. I believe we can do that as we trust in him. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, your mercy and your grace. And Father, as we come to the end of our time together here, we thank you that we have the privilege of living for you. It's not always easy. Each of us has some things to work on. God, help us to live out our faith, our trust in you, by doing what you call us to do. Lord, sometimes we need a little more wisdom about what exactly that is and how that can be accomplished and what that looks like. But Lord, our, may our hearts be open to say, God, whatever you ask me to do, that's what I'm going to do. God, I pray that you just help us to be those people that you have called us and created us to be in the world in which we live. And God, we thank you that as we do that, you are always with us to help us, guide us, lead us, and empower us. We give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen.